The first reading is from Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Chapter 40 is the beginning of Isaiah's prophecy regarding the Jewish exile to Babylon. And it shows that God will be consoling his discouraged people who will be in exile, especially the often quoted last verse of this reading. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And in this passage, Paul is urging the church at Corinth to win over the non-believers by understanding them by becoming one with their audience through preaching that is sensitive to the different cultures that they will encounter. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who under the law are present. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might have some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to the old Titans is St. Mark, the first chapter. <clears throat> as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. 
Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a de- deserted pl- went out into a deserted pl- place, and then he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, "Everyone is searching for you." He answered, "Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do." And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Well, late last night, the Nicaraguan mission team returned into town and... I'd just like to reintroduce them to you, so if you would all stand up, please, and face the congregation. We are missing two from our team. Ken Henricks is still in Nicaragua, and Faith Faith Williams' niece, Becky, has returned to her home in Waterloo. Um, I think I speak for the whole team when I say that this is very bittersweet to be back. Obviously, it's a very good thing. It feels good to be here. But at the same time, we're missing our brothers and sisters in Christ down in Nicaragua. In today's gospel, uh, Jesus is approached about uh, people from the town that he was in wanting to to have them come out and heal them and to cure them and to cast out more demons and continue on in that town. But Jesus tells his disciples when they, they ask him that he must move on. The gospel must be on the move. It must continue to reach out to the world around us. And that's what Christ is. Christ is the gospel. He is the word incarnate. And he was on the move. During our mission trip, we very much felt the, this sense of the gospel being on the move as we moved from town to town to repair wells and to teach the, the villagers about hygiene and how to better their, their health. And so in a sense, we spread the gospel in the physical means of clean water and hygiene and more. And something happened. They brought the gospel to us. They changed us, and they strengthened our faith. Isn't it funny how that works? There's going to be a few people speaking about some important parts of this mission, and so we will we'll go through um, not only the pup repair, but also the water hygiene, and then highlighting a few of the people that we met. Um, at this time, we're going to watch a, a, a video of the very first well that we, we came to repair, and we'll see how that goes, and then Troy will come up and speak about the pump repair team. So, take a look.
Good morning. Um, just briefly, I'll, I'll name off the members that were uh, serving on the pump repair team. Doug Seltz, Michael Bacon, Faith Williams, Joe Denker, Ken Hendricks, and myself. And on behalf of the team, it truly was a blessing to go down and, and do the Lord's work, to be able to uh, provide fresh drinking water for the people, to work alongside of the Nicaraguan people in these communities. And I think I'm fairly safe in saying on behalf of the mission team, it was truly a blessing to have missed the snowstorm that you all experienced. <laughs> the, um, we went into four villages and repaired five pumps. But truly, this effort was really not about just fixing pumps. This was a concerted effort around sustainability. Sustainability in that the work that we're doing, and as you'll see in the pictures, we're working alongside of the community members from the villages. So the community, before we can go in, has to make a commitment to this project. They have to take responsibility and ownership of this pump and this very important community resource. If that doesn't happen in advance of our arrival, uh, that pump does not get repaired. So it's very important that if we just came in on our, on our own, fixed that pump and walked away without that community support, that pump will eventually break. And that's not what this is about. This is about a sustainable investment in that community. So this is truly a, not only a North American project, but is a Nicaraguan project, is after we leave, that um, we leave spare parts behind to that village. And that pump has a 90-day warranty, so to speak. So if something happens in that pump within 90 yeah. days, Living Water will repair it, our partner in this. After that 90 days, it becomes a community responsibility and a community expense. So that is ownership that's very important for this to sustain itself long after we're gone. And throughout the year, Living Water staff continue to do what we did last this week, um, repairing pumps, but also doing it with the community. So I think that's really key. The, um, the villages that we went to were um, La Carreta, which means cart. Um, at this village, they no longer were drinking water from the pump because it had uh, uh, contaminated from the iron pipe that was in that, that pump. So they were getting their water from the local river for quite a while. They were very blessed to have that. Um, the other village is Dulce Nombre de Jesus, which is sweet name of Jesus. La Fleur, which is flower. Um, that pump, they had not used the, the water from that well for two years, and were having to go to an adjacent community to get water to their, to their community. And the last one was La Cebita, and I failed to get a, an English translation, so I thought, well, I will just Google it this morning. So I brought up a Spanish to English translator, and I don't think the community intended to name, to name their village after the stealthy anteater. So <laughs> I really I don't know what the name of that village is other than La Sabita. <laughs> Lost in translation. So the work in itself consisted of testing the water initially, and that was testing for hardness, contaminants, iron content, really all of the things we would do testing our water here. Um, if it also would consist of replacing either a rope pump, which tends to be a Nicaraguan invention. You won't see it very far out of Nicaragua, maybe some adjacent Central America countries. Very um, basic, but also um, highly prone to failure. And then the other one, no like pump would be an Indy Mark II, which were originally put in by Living Water, but these are the pumps that had the um, galvanized pipe. And the water was, um, um, because of the pH, would corrode and take the galvanizing off of the pipe, contaminating the pipe with rust. And so that was a part of our work. Replacing every one of these pumps with an Afrodiv, developed in Africa, total cost for the parts is around $1,000 per well, $1,000 per pump. Okay. So that, that in, a, in essence, gives you a sense of the work of the, um, the pump team. It truly was a partnership. Once we're gone, this work will continue, and I think that's very important to, to remember. So for the congregation, the foundation, and all those that supported this mission effort and making that work, that work continues in our absence, which is, um, I think, extremely important to keep in mind. It, it's not just our presence down there doing the work. This is really intended to lift those communities up and sustain them on their own. 
Okay, so now I will introduce Sharon Perkins on behalf of the sanitation and hygiene team. There were actually five of us on this team. Three of us are here today, myself, Elsa Martins, and Jane Walstead. The other two members um, are not here. One of them is uh, Faith's niece, Becky Bishorner, and the other one was our interpreter, who was Hockneyer. But we went down there and really worked with the people. The mothers and the children all came and we gave them presentations, tried to engage them with what we were doing. Elsa started out with a presentation about germs and germ transmission. She did a great job with this huge, ugly fly, <laughs> rubber fly, that she used to help teach about germ transmission. I followed her with uh, a presentation and demonstrations about proper hand washing. We all demonstrated and the children did it after we did. And then um, we passed out little individual pieces, uh, bars of soap for them to take and use for themselves. The third item was um, um, Becky. She came next and she gave a presentation about um, oral rehydration solution which treated diarrhea. We had little packets that gave the information about how to do it and we gave out the little spoons that go with it. Then we had um, Hockneyer who gave a presentation about uh, oral hygiene. She taught the proper toothbrush um, use and um, used a set of giant teeth and a giant toothbrush. So the kids got a big kick out of that. Then Jane followed with our presentation of the Bible lesson. She had wonderful presentations. We did uh, today, um, Jesus walk on, Walks on Water, and we made boats for the kids. And probably the most fun was the last one when we did the parable of the lost sheep. If you'll see on there, I hope there's some pictures of the children with the masks that we made. We made masks of the, of the sheep, and the children just had a wonderful time. But the thing that really impressed me were that the children and the parents were so patient. Jane kept telling me, you have to be versatile, because things don't always work out the way you think they are in the time period you think they're going to have to be. So they waited for whatever we needed to have time for, and um, just really had a great time. But the best part was the one where we made, where we made the, uh, the sheep's masks. The children had a ball with those. We even um, got Joe involved with, them, with that. We helped, he helped cut out the ears for the masks. So if you see that on there, that's a great thing. But we had a wonderful, wonderful time down there. And the, and the children and the, and the mothers were so receptive to everything that we told them. So now Jane's going to come up and speak about our interpreter, Hockneyer, and her husband, Guillermo's special, special mission. One thing I did want to add to uh, the health and hygiene, we, pa we passed out health kits each time we were at a village, and in that we had a towel and soap, toothpaste, and a toothbrush. And all the mothers and children, we had over, was it 350? So we passed those out, and also sewing kits for, for the uh, mothers, and they really liked those as well. Now, uh, my presentation is about uh, something a little bit different. It's but it involves all of us as well as you. And it starts last year when our uh, translator or interpreter was uh, what we thought was the wrong person that came. But Lord, the Lord had a master plan. And Hockner was our translator last year, but she could not stop talking about her husband's ministry planting a church. 
and her husband, Guillermo, had been in pharmacy, and the Lord kept calling him to plant a church, plant a church. And so that would have been two years ago. So she, that he was not only called to plant a church, but in the very poorest section of uh, Lyon, which is the third largest city in uh, Nicaragua. And anything you can imagine was in this uh, very poor, poor part of the city. And he was called to plant a church there. And so this is a story of uh, Guillermo Omraio, his wife, Hockner, and their two beautiful daughters, Deborah and Lindsay. Deborah is eight now, and Lindsay is three. Beautiful. I hope you get to see a picture of them. Anyhow, how do you start planting a church? It reminded me of the stories in the book of Acts. And so, first of all, they bought a place to live in this very poor part of Lyon. And then Guillermo would go out to establish uh, confidence with those people that lived in that area. He would go from house to house. And then soon they had little groups of people at the school that would come to their house. And then they would have Bible stories. And then the story continues with last year when uh, not only our team was able to help them, uh, but uh, Save a Generation came alongside and then they started a feeding station with a few people. And now, when uh, we visited, they were, at, uh, for Save a Generation, they would start with maybe three days a week and have a little food for people to come. Now they serve 130 every day. And this is uh, with fortified rice and uh, manna packs, which, uh, are good nutrition for them. So they are doing that every day, and they have cooks now. And you, St. Olaf, have helped in that you have sent funds for them to have chairs and tables. And this is in a, like a little patio just off their home. And now they want to build, also want to build a church. And so they have bought land, and uh, you have provided funds for them to build a fence. I hope you get to see a picture of that. We got to visit that area. It is a beautiful setting. It's under trees, and you can we could see the fence around there, and so we were there. And last Sunday, we worshiped with them in their home. So that was a great blessing for us. And uh, we heard many times, Buenos dias, Dios te bendiga, God bless you. And that is what we send to you as well, because it wasn't just for us, because you are involved in it too, because you are supporting us and supporting their, their, their new church, which now there's another uh, congregation that's also supporting them from North Carolina. And they are coming down in March, and they're going to start to build the foundation. So it's so exciting. It's just wonderful. And uh, Guillermo is the most patient, compassionate man, and he loves the children. And he, uh, Hockner told me that he does not turn anyone away. He welcomes everyone, so we know that God's love, God's unconditional love is there. And that is what amazes us, because when we go, we feel that love, and we just are so thankful to see how it is working in this very, very poor part of Lyon. So I bring blessings to you from the people, because when we worshiped, they would hug us and ask blessings for us, and we got to be there while he had his service. So thank you for letting us go. We appreciate your support so much. Thank you.
Hello, everybody, and good morning. I'm Michael Bacon, and I'm from St. Paul's, and I just thank you for letting me go with the mission group. I've been so blessed. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sponsored children, um, which we um, took a lot of packets to those who you have all sponsored. And it's so wonderful to see them every year. It's, it's, it's like you never left. Um, you go and it's been a whole year and you know who you right away you can kind of figure out who they were even though they've grown and changed every year. Um, Ken Henricks um, has sponsored Melvin for over 10 years now. And um, in that duration, he had a bad accident um, with his face. They were, I think it was with a firecracker, um, and it didn't go off. And I don't know exactly the whole steps of it all, but um, he had it up by his mouth, and it took his whole cheek off his face. And he was quite lucky that he didn't have an eye removed or anything. And um, he's just done remarkable because people, Ken has helped and the church has helped as well. Um, he's had a surgery every year. So he has had six surgeries. And in the last three years, I've seen such a change. And this last time, it was so remarkable because he always wears a bandana across his face <clears throat> to keep it clean and for the dirt, which around there is very hard to keep things clean because it's very dry and dusty. And um, so he's had to undergo a surgery every year. And he'll be undergoing another one, I believe, in June this year. So he's going to be having more work. But he is so... Um, the love of Christ just beams with him. Um, and his family is also, his mother has the church in their home. So they meet in his home every, every week. And I think in some of the locations we notice, they don't just go to church once a week. They go several times a week. It's amazing, because I think sometimes we have a difficult time trying to bring ourselves here once a week. And they go several times. And they are so happy and so filled with the spirit of blessing God and thanking God for what they have. And they have so much less than what we have. It's amazing. So now I'm going to introduce Doug Seltz, who's going to talk about Amelia. Uh, I would like to personally thank you, everybody, for the opportunity for us to go down there. It's amazing to see the kids. I'm going to talk generally about the kids and, and another person. Um, it's a perfect time to go down there. This is, this is right before they start school, and parents come up and say, we don't, we don't have enough money to get the kids in. They need school clothes. Uh, so we give, give them money for school clothes because they have to have uniforms and materials. And then also, I, I just can't believe the struggles that these young kids have day in and day out with their faith. And it's remarca remarkable. Um, I've been sponsoring this one child since she was three. Now she's going to be 18 and um, she wants to go to college. She's working there to, to get to college. And as determined she is, she will get there. And um, my, I, I would love to bring one of these kids back here someday to visit with you and thank, thank you guys what you do for them. Um, so, and then also we should, Pray for them right now because the day we left San Mateo, they had an earthquake. They had a 5.6 earthquake at Shenandoah, and the news report about 80 some people were killed, 
houses were destroyed. Um, it didn't make national news, but we uh, saw it on the news down there, and we got some reports. So I hope all the people we worked with are in um, were in harm. Uh, we're able to communicate with a lot of them. I bought a cell phone for a little girl so we can communicate with her so she can go to um, computer school. She needs uh, money to go to computer school, so we're helping her out and so we can Facebook them. Um, and this Amelia is a tremendous young lady now, and she's going to be singing a song that she wrote praising God um, at the close of the day. So that's all I have. Thank you. And thanks again for your support. together confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And we have a video uh, for the close, please be seated. I'm going to sing a song. Uh, it's a song that she wrote uh, to celebrate uh, God's life. And uh, so she wants to sing it to us. <laughs> Where's your tent trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the ginger?
I want to tell you why that I wrote this song and what it says. I wrote this song because I wanted to thank God uh, because He's been good to me. And because he, uh, he was like a light in my life, you know. And I had, I have a, a name it, uh, Thank You God. And this is a song I always sing at the temple. I hope you like it, enjoy it. Cada día antes que se va, le doy gracias a mi Dios. Y en cada linda mañana que veo salir el sol, solo mi Dios es el que me enseñó a ver las cosas que el mismo. Oh! 